this windswept road. High in the wastes of the world's driest desert, where no rain falls for decades at a time, two ghostly cities bake in a blistering sun. Silent and largely forgotten today, they were once among the most important sites on Earth. From this blasted landscape, these gigantic tanks, these shattered mills, a substance was mined and processed that gave life to millions and spread violent death across the world. These are the ruins of Humberstone and Santa Laura in the harsh highlands of Chile's Atacama Desert. I believe that the only time scientists have ever registered zero humidity has been in the Atacama Desert. Up until the First World War, the so-called Caliche deposits of the Atacama were virtually the world's only source of one of agriculture's most critical substances, nitrates, commonly known as saltpeter. Sodium nitrate exists naturally in the desert of Atacama. Water from the Andes would flow into this coastal desert and settle in salt pans, little lakes, little pools, and suffer, of course, evaporation in this climate. All plants need nitrogen to grow. For millennia, that nitrogen mostly came from animal manure. But as the world's population exploded in the 19th century, supplies couldn't keep pace. The discovery of these deposits averted global disaster. Since it has nitrogen, when applied as a fertilizer, this led to perhaps the first agricultural revolution in modern times. But ironically, the nitrates that saved millions from famine were also key to the world's most destructive substance, gunpowder. The mining of Caliche was the only imaginable reason towns would be built in perhaps the world's most inhospitable desert. But here, the biggest enemy wasn't the climate. It was human greed. In towering wrecks like this, the mine owners refused to take the most basic safety precautions. The result was a constant harvest of death. When I graduated as an engineer, my first working opportunity was this industry. The land was perforated with a pick, then explosives were added. Then a group of workers would come in and the material would be broken up by 25-pound hammers. That is, if workers survived the initial explosions. Handling gunpowder had big planning problems because many times people would not move away a sufficient distance and sometimes they would get hit. And some would die. There were many injuries like broken bones. Some even lost limbs from the explosions. Moving the material was just as dangerous. After this material was broken up, it was transported by trucks and pulled by mules and taken to the railroad to be transported to the plant. This extremely narrow gauge railway is all that's left of a huge system that once hauled the Caliche to the mill. Constant derailments cost countless lives. 
Narragate railways usually were very important for the transport from the salitreras, from the nitrate fields. The railways were small. The gauge was just 76 centimeters, so cars would derail, causing accidents. Brakemen would get injured and some of them would die. This locomotive would assemble every morning with a train of wagons filled with sacks of nitrate to be taken down the coast to Iquique, nearly 50 kilometers away. Here, at the mill itself, a toxic dust cloud obscured even deadlier dangers. There are two phases in the processing of sodium nitrate that affected the workers' health. The crushing and the boiling. The crushing enveloped the workers in clouds of, of dust. This is one of four giant crushing machines in Santa Laura. The nitrate-bearing rock would arrive by railway in this shed overhead. The wagons would tip sideways and the rock would tumble down the funnels to the crushing machines. This was actually the first part of the crushing process and it produced smaller rocks which were then taken in a conveyor belt to a secondary crushing plant. Many accidents took place on the mill. They tried to put their hands in when there was some material stuck and they would lose a finger or an arm. These great tanks took the crushed caliche and boiled it down. The toxic process was called lixiviation. Here in these tanks, the caliche is lixiviated, which goes to solution, and is sent to the crystallization plant to be extracted. The boiling we're talking about temperatures of 120 degrees centigrade in closely combined quarters. Clearly not very beneficial to someone's health. The dehydration risk was very high and a lot of the workers developed health problems, like bronchial and pulmonary diseases. For decades, mine owners refused to provide these tanks with a simple safeguard steel grills to prevent workers from falling in. The result could be gruesome. Temperatures were over 200 degrees. People would fall in and they would burn to death. Often, bodies would simply be left in vats like this to mummify, and then be shipped off to foreign lands, entombed in their nitrate graves. For the nitrate workers, conditions like this led to endless suffering. But soon, they would lead to rebellion and one of the greatest labor tragedies in Latin American history. Murray comes from a long line of nitrate workers, or Pampinos. He remembers the golden days when the fabulous riches that poured from these towns almost single-handedly supported Chile's economy. I was an only child, but I had many Pampino uncles, and one of them worked here in Humberstone. It had a church, theater, pool, school. Our vacations were taken here, Humberstone, Santa Laura. Guillermo knew these towns just before they were completely abandoned in the 50s. For him, they seemed magical. But for most of their history, they were a veritable hell on earth. It was a very different reality in the 19th century. Because at that time, people practically worked from sunrise to sunset and in barbarous conditions. The 
manager, the administrator of an officina was a lord unto himself. He defined the norms of behavior, the norms of working. We're actually in front of the managers or the administrator's home, and it's very large. Many rooms, one can see the services that are provided for the upkeep of the, what is really a mansion. It is said that in the evenings, the usually British managers, the administrators, the chief engineers would meet and they would dress up for the occasion. There was a sense of etiquette, the best of food, the best of wine. But while the masters lived in luxury, the workers lived in appalling poverty. A worker had a small room to live in, with only a space for a bed and a small kitchen. A typical worker here didn't even have a bed to call his own. There was even the famous hotbeds, as they were called. For example, I would work to early morning, and when I would go to bed, my co-worker would get up and go to work, hence the hotbed. 